Alright, so in this video we're going to solve the simple pendulum system using both the Newtonian and the Lagrangian mechanics approaches. So the first thing I want to do is to define what this pendulum system is. We have a mass here that is very very large compared to the mass of the rod. So the rod connecting the, the support here to the mass is very small in comparison so we can neglect its mass. The displacement of the pendulum is basically described by the angular displacement and the total length of the rod from the pivot point to the center of mass of this little hanging mass here, is just L. Now, according to the Newtonian mechanics, what we do is we split this into, we draw the free body diagram and we're going to have a bunch of forces acting here. So we're going to have forces acting at the support, so we have vertical and horizontal reaction forces. And then here, the peculiar thing is that we have the, the weight force acting on it. And then we are going to have a sort of a tangential kind of force, which is due to the tangential component of the acceleration. So you can imagine that at any point in time, when this thing is swinging back and forth, this is the, the total force that will result. Now there's a little bit of a problem with this. So basically, I need to make this negative. And the reason for that is that when this thing is swinging this way, then it is actually decelerating. And when it is swing, swinging this way, it is decelerating in the, in, this in the other direction. So we need to make sure that we take into account the fact that the motion is in the opposite direction. So that the motion of the angular acceleration is the, in the opposite direction. Now, if we resolve the component of the weight here in terms of this straight line here along the rod, we can actually take the sum of torques about the point O to avoid having to solve for those two reaction forces and then we can relate the tangential acceleration directly to the force of the weight. So basically we're going to have this equation here and because the radius remains constant and the pivot point does not move we can use the relationship between angular acceleration alpha and tangential acceleration over the radius and then we substitute this back into here and then after rearranging terms and making the substitution alpha for theta double dot we arrive at the equation of motion here which is just the equation of motion of a simple pendulum so you might actually have seen this before when they sometimes make the small angle approximation which is for less than 15 degrees you can actually assume that sine theta is approximately equal to theta so this nonlinear equation, this is a nonlinear second order differential equation, actually becomes linear for this little limit here. But of course we're talking about physics and classical mechanics and we care about the most general case. So this is the one that we're going to use, not the approximation. Now the next thing I want to talk about, this, this was a fairly straightforward method. We only needed to take a little bit of care of the sign convention here. And um, we're going to use the Lagrangian method now, so the way we're going to do this is as follows. We have, our, we have our system here. We need to, first of all, define a coordinate system, so y, x. We have our theta here. We have the pendulum mass, theta, the total length, L. Now we need to define how, uh, the gravitational potential energy, or essentially just related to the height. So. We have the weight of the system, right, acting about its center, center of mass. So that means that we could pretty much just define the potential energy from some point here. So basically, if, as seen from this direction, we notice that the maximum height that this can ever have is going to be L. So basically, the total height, let me just write it down here at any point in time it's going to be L minus L cosine of theta because we're going to take, be taking into account the horizontal component of this length here. So this is going to be the height. So in that respect we can actually write the potential energy in terms of mgh and then this is of course going to be mg times L minus L cosine theta and then we can just simplify this to mgl 1 minus cosine of theta okay so that's going to be the potential energy for this system now for the kinetic energy what we're going to have is the following we have half of mv squared so we're taking into account the velocity of the center of mass of this hanging bob here 
But you notice, well, what is the velocity in this case? We're talking about tangential velocity, right? So that's the, the velocity that defines this motion from side to side. So how do we relate tangential velocity? Well, velocity tangential is actually equal to the radius of rotation times the angular velocity. So basically, this is the equation that we use here. So this is going to become half of m times, in this case, r is just l. So we have this. So l squared times the angular velocity squared. And thus, the Lagrangian of this system becomes t minus v, which is half of m l squared theta dot squared minus mgl 1 minus cosine theta and it is often useful to expand this out so we're going to have ml squared theta dot squared minus mgl plus mgl cosine of theta and you notice that I could pretty much just factor out the the ml out of this equation but you'll notice that because we want to keep our variables separate, we want to keep velocities and displacement separate from each other so that the differentiation becomes easier, it is easier to just expand everything out so we have separate terms for each. Alright, so now what we need to do is plug this into our Euler-Lagrange equation, which is this one here. In this case we're going to have theta as our coordinate, so we have Lagrangian with respect to theta, so we have to find those two derivatives there. So let's start off with the easiest one, which is just the displacement. So this is treated as a constant, so it becomes zero. Now this becomes zero, and we're going to have, what's the derivative of this? Well, that's just going to be minus mgl sine of theta. Now for this variable, for this derivative here, we're going to treat theta as a constant so that becomes zero this becomes zero and then this is going to be two over two over two that's one so ml squared theta dot and if we take the time derivative of this particular derivative here take the time derivative of this so we're going to have ml squared So this becomes theta double dot. So that is pretty much it. So now if we put these things together, let's just put it into the equation here. ML squared theta double dot equals to minus MGL sine theta. So once again, the M cancels out. One of these goes out with that. And then what we can do is we can rearrange this to get the following equation plus g over l times sine of theta equals to zero. So you notice here that we got exactly the same equation and yeah, it did take a little bit more work, but you notice that we arrived at the same result simply based on the energy. Now the advantage that the Lagrangian mechanics approach has is that we took care of the sign convention that was giving us trouble here by simply just defining the potential energy in terms of this maximum length with respect to the pivot point here. So we managed to de basically define the sign convention and automatically the Euler-Lagrange equation took care of that when, we, when it came to substituting in. So we didn't have to deal with that issue. Whereas here, we have to really think about what the acceleration is doing before putting it into the equation. So it can get tricky a little bit. But you can see that both methods are pretty much always arrive at the same answer. And we'll continue doing some ex more examples so you get the idea as to where the Lagrangian method is useful and why it is actually quite interesting and quite beneficial for us to know how to apply it to physical problems.